Let's get into the Word of God. You have your Bibles. Turn with me to uh, 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 18. This is right after the climactic battle with Goliath. Can everybody hear me okay up, up there in the balcony? You guys hear me okay? We've been working on the sound. I'm telling you, man, there are some demons in the sound system. We have been working on Be patient with us. I'm, I'm ser- we are going to chase all those ghosts away. It will happen. We are in 1 Samuel chapter 18, starting with verse 1. When you have it, say amen. Oh, I didn't hear a lot. Some people are still searching. 1 Samuel is in the Old Testament. Here we go. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 1 says, After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. Because remember, before this time, he was going back and forth between being a a sheep herder and also working for Saul as his armor bearer and musician in his courts. Verse 3 says, And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. What a beautiful friendship they had. The Bible speaks of their friendship in the most glowing of terms, and I love it. We probably could just do an entire message just on the friendship of David and Jonathan. Verse 4 says, Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. Whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was successful that Saul, with what Saul had given him, and, get, and Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. Verse 6 says, when the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with timbrels and lyres. As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his... Thousands and David his ten thousands. That was a top 40 hit, fam. Trust me, even the Philistines heard this song, and you'll hear about it later on in the message. Verse 8 says, Saul, Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with ten thousands, he thought, but me with only a thousand. What more can he get but the kingdom? What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. The next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully on Saul. He was prophesying in his house while David was playing the harp, as he usually did. Saul had a spear in his hand and hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. Go down to verse 12. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David, but had departed from Saul. Verse 28 and 29 as we close out, when Saul realized the Lord was with David, that his daughter Michal loved David, Saul became still more afraid of him, and he remained his enemy the rest of his days. I want to speak to you from the title, Split Down the Middle. Let us pray. Father, We thank you so much for the invitation to be in your presence, and we love the fact that we get to read all of your text messages that will open our eyes and our ears to what you have to share with us. Father, we just want to have fertile soil. We want to be receptive. Make that our reality for this worship experience. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, amen. I read a really large chunk of scripture because I wanted you to see the ebb and flow of David and Saul's relationship, how they interacted with one another. In fact, everything I really want you to get in this message, you find embedded in this passage that we just read. Saul doesn't seem quite like himself, right? Now, most of you who know the story of Saul would say, Pastor, he's right on cue. He's, he's doing exactly what I expected him to do because you've heard and read the stories about Saul many, many, many times. But you have to understand, up until this point, Saul wasn't crazy. Up until this point, if you were to observe his behavior, you would think he's a pretty sound king. Now remember, Saul was king for 42 years. We talked about this early on in the series. When God called Saul into the position of being a a monarch among his people, 
Saul was a very humble man. That's what the Bible tells us. And he understood himself in these terms of humility. Remember when uh, Samuel the prophet rolled up on him and said, bro, I'm about to anoint you as the king of Israel. What did he say? I am a nobody. My family is a nobody. My family is the least in the tribe of, uh, 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 the, of our tribe, and our tribe is the least among all the tribes, and I'm the least in my family. I am a zero. Why would you want me? In fact, when Samuel even announces to Israel who the new king would be, you find Saul hiding behind some barrels because he does not want to be elected. Saul was a humble man. He was a good man. Some like to say that God only selected him because that's what the people wanted. No, the people wanted a king, but God wanted to choose among them the very best to be king. Are you guys understanding that? The people asked for a king, and God said, let me choose the best among you because God would make the best choice on who would be king. But as we've already shared in this beginning of this series, the position of being a king was never God's will. Never God's will. Even though that is what they prayed for and God answered their prayer, it was never a prayer that should have been answered to begin with. We talked about this before already. Some prayers that are answered are answered because it's what we want, not because of what God wants. And let me tell you something. One thing we bet to learn, and we bet learn it right now, don't pray for things that are not in God's will. Because even when he answers them, it may not turn out in your best interest. Hello, King Hezekiah. Hello, Moses. There's a number of stories we can just go down. There's a just, it, it, it's just all throughout Scripture where people's prayers are answered, and they're so excited about it initially, but it does not turn out well for them. And so this is where we find ourselves in this situation. Clearly, something is off about Saul. The Bible tells us that God sent an evil spirit, and that spirit is what was haunting him. But remember this. The author of First and Second Samuel, if I may doesn't have the clearest picture of how God works. God does not send evil our way. I need to say this again, because some of us work from an old school way of thinking that everything that happens, happens for a reason. That person that you got involved in, got, got involved with and broke your heart, you, you, you want to sanitize that thing. You want to anoint it. You want to make it all a part of God's holy will. God knew what he was doing. no. You thought you knew what you were doing. And you didn't want to listen. But boy, don't we know how to make all the signs fit everything? <laughs> well, you know what? They showed up at the same gas station. God is working. No, y'all just showed up at the same gas station. That's all. Stop making it some part of God's heaven, heavenly design. There are things that happen in our life because life simply happens, not because God is orchestrating it. But how do you know God's will? Know him. Christ says, if, you, if my sheep know my voice, and often it takes patience and diligence for us to really discern the will of God. Can I say something else? Y'all ready? Not everything that is God's will works out. You weren't ready for that one? Not everything that is God's will works out. Hello, Garden of Eden? God's will for Adam and Eve to have uh, his likeness and to be able to choose between good and evil, and yet they choose incorrectly. It got so bad that in chapter 6 of Genesis, God says, I shouldn't have made man. He was grieved. He was sorry that he made us. That's, that, that hurts. God looking at me and saying, oops. There are things that are God's will that don't work out, but they don't work out because God failed on his end. They don't work out because we fail on our end. Many of people that have gone through splits, marriages, relationships, where you say, Lord, but I thought this was the right person. And God says, they were, but you started acting wrong. I had nothing to do with that part of it. 
You're the one that got stubborn. You're the one that became selfish. You're the one that became self-absorbed. You stopped being other-centered. You stopped listening, and that's why it blew up. Not because I made the wrong decision. I made the correct decision, but you stopped making the right decision in my will. And that's why things go wrong. But I want to speak specifically in this message about how things go wrong for Saul, if you don't mind. I want to just kind of unpack just a a few things that we have to learn because clearly Saul has some mental health issues. And as I said, the author of 1 Samuel didn't have the clearest picture of God. What Saul is dealing with, I believe, is a disorder, a mental health disorder. And there's four kinds of mental health disorders, and I'm not going to speak to all four of them specifically, and I'm not even going to suggest that this is exactly what Saul has and he's diagnosed with. But there are mood disorders such as depression and bipolar disorder. There's anxiety disorders. There's personality disorders, and there's psychotic disorders. But clearly, Saul has some type of mental health disorder because all throughout his relationship with David, he vacillates strongly between, from the left to the right, from being kind and loving and accepting to being hateful and vengeful. And so this is what he's struggling with. And again, the author of 1 Samuel is most likely not aware of these type of mental health disorders, so he just simply calls it an evil spirit from God. The author of 1 Samuel believes that everything that happens is by God's uh, will, by God's doing, by God's signing off. In fact, there's one part in, the, in uh, David's story that we will highlight later on where the author of, of, of uh, First and Second Samuel says that God tempted David and made David do something evil and then punished him for doing the evil thing he made him do. The author of Chronicles comes around and says, no, it wasn't God, it was Satan who actually was the culprit. And so when we read scripture, we have to read with the lens of our understanding, what we know, our education today. God does not send evil spirits our way. God does not send calamities in your life. God does not create drama in your life and throw it your direction. God is not the author of confusion. God is not a liar. There is no darkness in him. If you are dealing with mess and you are dealing with drama and you are dealing with darkness or evil spirits, it is because we live in a broken, sin-riddled world. Are you guys understanding that? Don't confuse life with God. Don't confuse drama with God. Don't confuse cancer with God. Don't don't confuse sex trafficking and homelessness with God. That is not God. That is a byproduct of sin. And most of us lose our faith because we often, we often conflate Satan with God, good with evil, and we have to stop it. This is what keeps many of our relationships with God split right down the middle. We have our own bipolar experience with God. God, I love you. God will give everything. And then God will where are you? I, I don't think you even exist. We, we were, we're agnostic one moment and full of faith the other. So clearly he's going through some type of disorder here. And David's purpose in, in Saul's life in this moment is to help bring about peace. His purpose in, this, in, in Saul's life is to play an instrument and, and be a calming influence in his life. But I want to say something to you right now because mental health is a tough topic to talk about in church because many of us believe that faith will solve all our issues. That if you just simply have enough religion, you won't have any problems. Anybody hear that before? You're struggling with anxiety or depression or maybe you are bipolar or maybe you you have one of these mood disorders. Or maybe you're just hungry. Or maybe it's a certain time during the month. Whatever the reasons may be. Have you ever heard somebody say, it's just in your head? It's just in your head. Anytime someone says that, I want to say, duh, (laughs) that's the problem. (laughs) That is exactly the problem. It's in my head. And what's in my head, it filters everything that I experience. Do you think that people who struggle with any of these disorders wake up in the morning and say, you know what, I just want to look at the world half empty. 
I want to have the worst attitude. I want to be pessimistic. I don't want to see hope in anything. If any of you have struggled with any of these mental health issues, you know how paralyzing it is. And, and us with our toxic positivity, I need to say that again, us with our toxic positivity, because positivity, positivity can be toxic at times depending on when it's applied. Going up to your kids and saying, just stay positive. Going up to your spouse and saying, just cheer up. Saying to people, things could be worse. Relax, it'll pass. Come on, only good vibes. I was around somebody the other day who, who, who uh, was around their child. Their child was going through an issue. They said, come on, just good vibes, just good vibes. You'll get over it, right? It's all in your head. Or some of the worst religious ones. God is in control. Have you heard that before? Don't worry, God is in control. Your child is dying of cancer and someone rolls up to you and says, don't worry, God is in control. Oh, he's controlling this, so he's the one I should be mad at. Toxic positivity. How about this one? Everything happens for a reason. I said this before, I'll say it again. Everything cannot happen for a reason because sin is unreasonable. Do not give a reason for everything. Sin is unreasonable, but toxic positivity can actually do more damage. In these kind of situations, what people need to know is that you are empathetic, that you hear them. It, it's okay to feel bad sometimes. This is what we need to say to people. How can I support you? This must be difficult. Your feelings are valid. I'm listening. I understand. When we have this kind of attitude with our kids, not saying, well, when I was your age, this is how we coped with it. No, your kids live in a different age than you. And you'll say, but my kids have it easier than, than I do. No, 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 no. You didn't grow up with Facebook. You didn't grow up with Instagram and Snapchat. Your cameras had no filters to make people look like they all that. You have no idea what it's like to grow up in the internet age. No idea. The worst you had to compare yourself was like your next door neighbors. This age compares themselves with the rest of the world. So Saul struggled. They went back and forth, back and forth. When he saw that David and Jonathan had a good relationship, it made Saul insecure and jealous. When he saw that his daughter, Michal, liked, fell in love with David, it made him all the more insecure. Saul started sending David into battle, hoping, hoping that the Philistines would kill him. Think about that for a second, hoping the Philistines would kill him. When, when he realized his daughter had fallen in love with him, he was like, great, this relationship will weaken him. I'm hoping he falls so in love with her that he'll get killed in battle. Saul was crazy. But I want to give, give you three reasons why I think that we fall into a lot of these same mental health struggles, because many of us have it. We may not be diagnosed with it. It may not be as severe as others with a disorder, but many of us struggle with this from time to time. I'm going to suggest something to you that the reason why I think that Saul struggled with mental health, the first reason is that he was out of position and out of purpose. He was not in the position he should be in, and he was not living out his purpose. God told Samuel that there should not be a king in Israel, that he alone was the king. He says, Saul, Samuel, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me as their king. Now you'll say to me, but pastor, God called him to this position. No, the people called Saul into this position. God simply elected the best among them. There's a difference, right? There's a difference. But watch this. Who should of Saul been then? If he wasn't to be king, who should Saul have been? You guys are going to love this one. If Saul was living out his purpose, if Saul was actually doing what I believe he was called to do and gifted to do, he would most likely not be a king, he would be a prophet. How many times in Saul's story do we catch him prophesying? How many times is it said that, that Saul is prophesying? Even when, when David's playing the harp trying to, to kind of calm his fears and, and soothe his anxiety, the Bible tells us that Saul was prophesying. 
There's times when he was chasing after David, hunting him down to murder him, and he gets caught up in the spirit and starts prophesying with other prophets and loses his clothes. Saul, you're not ready for this, Saul was a prophet. You don't like the way that sounds? Because he's supposed to be the villain. No, pastor, we need our clear villains. He's an Ursula. We need clear villains. Don't try, to, don't try to make him a sympathetic figure. But no, if you prophesy, you're a prophet. If you preach, you're a preacher. If you teach, you're a teacher. Saul prophesied. God was working through Saul. He was prophesying, sharing messages with those who could hear. I think if Saul was in his element, if he was in his position and purpose, he would have been perfectly fine. Many of us, when we find ourselves with mental health struggles, we, have, we need to look no further than being out of position and purpose. Ask yourself, am I where I'm supposed to be? Am I doing what God has called me to do? Am I, am I in the place where God is leading me? Some of you aren't supposed to be CEOs. Can I say that again? Some of you are not supposed to be directors. Some of you can't handle that stress. Some of you, your personality is not fit for it. And this is why you have so much anxiety. And it's okay. Some of you are not the first chair clarinet. And it's okay. It's okay. I think about this all the time. Trust, watch this. You know, we started this series, Heart of a Champion. Remember focusing on Rudy Tomjanovich's uh, uh, quote at the end of winning the finals with the Houston Rockets. So I'm in a basketball mood. And of course, at the time, I thought the Lakers were going to go all the way. So it just seemed so fitting at the time. But the Lakers wanted to go against the will of God. That's another sermon for another time. But watch this. But watch this. When the, when, the Lakers, when the Lakers won their, their, uh, their championship with Kobe and Gasol, there was something that happened with one of their players who struggled with mental health really hard. His name was Lamar Odom. You guys are familiar with Lamar Odom? Lamar Odom was constantly ridiculed in the press as Kobe Bryant's number two guy. People talked about what an ill fit he was that he wasn't strong enough to really support Kobe Bryant and that they needed somebody else. In comes Pau Gasol. And Lamar Odom, who was not successful as the number two in the pecking order, was now at the number three position. And he flourished in the number three position. Lamar Odom was a part of winning two championships with the Lakers because he was in his right position as the number three scorer, as the number three in the offense. He was able to do more, use all of his gifts, passing, rebounding, defense, and people marveled at how good he was. What happened when he was number two? Wasn't in his right position and right purpose. And family, we have to be really serious about this. Not everybody, not everybody is a CEO. Not everybody is the entrepreneur. Not everybody should be in the head position. Some people are called into different places and different positions. Some people have different purposes. And you have to ask yourself, what is mine? What is God calling me to be? I think if Saul was a prophet and that's all he had to be, he would have been just fine. Number two, in that text it's very clear that Saul has what I call the triplet problem. The triplets of covetousness, envy, and jealousy. They're triplets because they're very similar. They, there's some nuanced differences between them, but they're very, very, very similar. This is more prevalent among people today because of social media because we're able to see other people's lives and how God is blessing and how they're being used and we think, why is that not me? And what's wild is you'll have people that you look up to and you say, they have enough influence, they have enough followers, they have enough money, they have enough power, they have enough fame, and they're miserable because they're not comparing themselves to you, they're comparing themselves to Oprah. Do you know that even rich, wealthy people get insecure? Because they're not comparing themselves to you. They're comparing themselves to someone who has more than they have. 
No, 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 watch this, watch this. This, this, is not, this is not new. This is at the heart of sin. Lucifer, the Bible tells us in Ezekiel 28, was perfect in wisdom, perfect in beauty. He lacked nothing. Yet he was still dissatisfied because he compared himself to who? The Most High. The Most High. <laughs> See, LeBron James doesn't feel insecure around Austin Reeves. He feels insecure when he compares himself to Michael Jordan. So he's going to walk away. If he doesn't win another championship, if he doesn't win two more championships, he's going to walk away feeling like he failed. And we're going to say he's one of the greatest of all time, but it's not definitive enough for him. He wants to be the unanimous GOAT, the greatest of all time. So that man is probably having a hard time sleeping because he's not able to get his fifth championship this year. But that's his fault. He didn't want to follow the will of God. That's a whole other thing. Stop <laughs> shooting threes. Stop shooting threes. But this is so critical because even Adam and Eve were created in the likeness of God. They were already like God, but the serpent tempts them to become more like God, even though they were already like God, and now they become dissatisfied, although they're perfect. They're beautiful, never been insecure, never dissatisfied with anything, never had a depressed day in their life. But what happens? They begin to compare themselves. The serpent says, you think you're like God, but when you eat this fruit, you really will be. The triplets, man, covetousness, jealousy, envy, wanting something that someone else has. And the reason why this happens is because of their mama. If you have triplets, you've got to blame the mama. The reason, the reason why these triplets exist, the reason why they are birthed, the reason why we experience them is because of their mama called comparison. And as Ben Franklin says, comparison is the thief of what? The thief of joy. Comparison is the thief of joy. I'm going to tell you something right now. Many of you who are experiencing mental health struggles because you are constantly comparing yourself to others, get off of social media. No, seriously, get off of social media. Stop following that, that, that classmate of yours from high school that you never got along with and you're so sick of seeing her life and all her grandchildren and they went to Italy and you don't even know why because you pay a faithful tithe and she doesn't even go to church. Stop comparing yourself with others. You want to know why? Because there's no comparison. Because already there is no one like you. No, no, no. That's not just some kind of silly platitude. I mean, this is real talk. There is no one else like you. You're unique. You're different. Even though you may share some genetic qualities of your parents, you are still not them and they are not you. There is no one like you. So to compare yourself to others, is, is, it's silly and it's pointless because God made only one you. And you have a purpose, you have a place, you have a calling, and God wants to see you in that space. Don't compare yourself to anybody else. Oh, I don't know why God didn't ask me to preach there. I don't know why God didn't send me there. I don't know why he chose her over me. I, I could do the same things. Stop it. He chose them for a reason, and he has you for another. Amen. Comparison, indeed, is the thief of joy, and don't let your joy be stolen because of our incessant need to compare. Now, the Bible says that 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 Saul was afraid in our text, that Saul was afraid. He was afraid. And it's really difficult to kind of understand what he was so afraid of. Now, it is very likely that Saul was afraid of a lot of things that we are afraid of. And this is why we, again, have some of the mental uh, health struggles that we have. Many of us are afraid of losing our identity, losing our, our sense of worth. Some of us are, are afraid of our, uh, of our legacy not being intact. Some of us are afraid of, for our family, afraid of what will happen if we're gone. Some of us are afraid of being forgotten one day. But I want to I read something to you because this part is, is really powerful. As Saul is going through his struggles, I want you to see what happens to David. David is confronted 
with a couple of situations where he can take out Saul. You guys know the story. You guys know the story very well, where he can take out Saul, but chooses to spare Saul's life. And every time he spares Saul's life, Saul's like, bruh, he calls him his son. My son, is that my son, David? Is that my beloved son, David? Oh, thank you so much for sparing me. I won't, I will never hunt you again. Right, all this, all this right? And I believe Saul. In that space, I believe Saul. But the problem with mental health is it, it's not just this linear experience. The problem with mental health struggles is that you can be good one moment and your promises are, are you, you're really making promises from a good place. You are sincere. The problem is with mental health is you can be sincere one moment and the next day is, you don't feel the same, right? You don't quite feel the same. I don't think that Saul's lying. I just think that Saul is unaware of how strong his mood swings are. He's unaware of how strong his insecurities are. I think he's unaware of how strong his fear is and why it makes him change. But I want you to see how it impacts David. The Bible says, let's go there. Come on. 1 Samuel chapter 21. 1 Samuel chapter uh, uh, 21. And just so you know, uh, even as you're going to 21 and 19, the, the Bible talks about Saul prophesying uh, at Ramah, and again, he's still prophesying, even doing all the things that he's doing that is evil, he's still prophesying. God is still, God is still working with him. All right, watch this. It says in uh, 1 Samuel 21, verses 10 through 15, 1 Samuel 21, 10 through 15 says, that day David fled from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. There were five kings in Philistia, five kings. King Achish is the king of Gath. Anybody remember what's important about Gath? Anybody? Where did Goliath go to high school? Gath High, right? He's from Gath. David shows up at the hometown of the champion of the Philistines that he defeated. Can somebody say... My man is having a mental breakdown, right? He goes to King Achish, but the servants of Kish said to him, isn't this David the king of the land? Isn't, isn't he the one they sing about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Even the Philistines are bumping this tune. The Bible says in verse 12, David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, king of Gath. So he pretended to be what? He pretended to be insane. Can I just say something? I'm not sure if you're pretending right now, bruh. You might be just a little bit. Why would David run to the Philistines for help? Because he's hoping Saul will stop looking for him. Trust me, this is a, this is a precursor for another message coming up. Next week's message. So he's, he's looking for safety. He's looking for refuge. He's not trusting God. He's trusting now the enemy. So he pretended to be insane in their presence. And while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the doors of the gate and letting saliva run down his beard. David is having what we call a breakdown. Why I want to highlight this is I want you to see it's not just Saul, the bad people, it's not just Saul, the people who don't have enough faith. It's not just Saul, the Saul's in life where the spirit of God departs from them and, and clearly God has moved on. It even happens with the best of us. It happens to pastors. Yeah, we get a little crazy too. We have our moments as well. You'd be surprised what some pastors think about even in a place of of, 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 of leadership, a, a place where they're clear about their calling and still will sometimes act like they ain't called at all. Even the best of us have these moments and David has one of these moments. Family, what I want you to I want you see is this is everybody's experience. If you're a child of God, if you've been attending this church for, for decades, if, you're, if your parents helped build this church, you are not immune to having moments in your valleys. You are not immune to having struggles. No matter how strong your faith is, you will have dark valleys where you doubt. No matter how courageous you see yourself, you will have moments where you will feel like fear is just too overwhelming. Even John the Baptist, the greatest man ever born of a woman, Jesus' own words, was struggling with his faith in a dungeon. 
had to send a text message to Jesus. Hey, yo, cuz, <laughs> bruh, um, yeah, like, are you really the one or should we be looking for another? That's John the Baptist. His only purpose was to identify who Jesus was. And once he went through enough trials, once he went through enough pain, once he went through enough sense of abandonment, my man started losing his faith. Jesus, are you the one or is there somebody else? And even our Savior Jesus on the cross says, my God, my God, Abba, Abba, Daddy, Daddy, why have you left me? I get why you've pulled away from those who have rejected your laws. I get why you, you respected people's decision and allowed them to be cut off because of, their, because of their choices. But why me? I have been faithful. I have never left you. I have obeyed you. Why would you leave me? It doesn't matter who you are. If you have stepped foot on planet Earth, you will have days of insanity. It's just sin, man. And this is why we have to have compassion with one another. We want to judge people in the church. Oh, pastor, you don't know. I'll tell you exactly what she's about. This is what he's about. I'll tell you why they say what they say. You don't know people's struggles. You never walked in their shoes. I've learned this the most, especially in marriage where you are with somebody who has a completely different set of fears, a different way of being raised, and some things come to the surface in marriage that you didn't know existed. Some things come to the surface when you have children you didn't even know existed. And we have to step back and say, you know what? I can stand in judgment on this person and say they're, they're not committed enough, they don't love enough, they're not following God enough, or I can have compassion that what their struggles are are something I've never experienced before. And can I tell you another toxic, positive statement you can make? Oh, I know what that's like. You see, I know what it's like to lose a parent. When I was a kid, I lost a toy and stop. Because even you losing something or you losing your parent is not the same impact of them losing. You don't know what their situation is. You might have lost a parent with a good relationship with that parent. They might have lost a parent they felt abandoned by, and now they feel even worse. All we can do is just slide up next to somebody and with compassion say, you know what, I may not know everything that you're experiencing and feeling, but I'm here to fill it with you. Let's close on this. Let's close on this. Saul finally tells David what he's really afraid about. In one of their encounters, he says to David, you're, you're, you're going to be a king. <laughs> you're surely going to be a king here. But when you become king, can you, can you make sure that my legacy, my, my lifeblood, that, that my kids survive? Do not kill them off. That's what other nations do. Can you please be merciful? And David makes an oath with Saul. And says, this is what you were afraid of? You were afraid, that, you were afraid of me rising up and that one day I would take out your family? No, I make an oath. Now put a pen in that because no, the story goes on. But 1 Samuel 25, 1 Samuel 25, 21, 23, and 24, let's close on this. It says, verse 21 says, Then Saul said, I have sinned. Come back, David, my son, because you considered my life precious today. Can I just, can I just pause there? because you considered my life precious today. I will not try to harm you again. Surely I have acted like a fool and I have, I have been terribly wrong. First, going down to verse 23, the Lord rewards everyone for their righteousness and faithfulness. The Lord, del uh, this is David, uh, David's uh, statement, the Lord delivered you into my hands today, but I would not lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. As surely as I valued your life today, so may the Lord value my life and deliver me from all trouble. Family, when we see people that are struggling with their mental health, either because they're out of position and purpose, either because they have given way to the triplets of covetousness, jealousy, and envy because they're comparing, or because their fear has overwhelmed them. The one thing that we must never do, you did it with Saul, do not do it with one another. We don't write people off. We value their precious life. David shows value for Saul's life. This man tried to kill him five, six, seven times. That's just what we have recorded in Scripture. It could have been more than that. 
David's running for his life and his mental health is struggling to the point where he's going to live with the Philistines. And yet when David has a chance to end it all, he chooses to have compassion on Saul's life because it is precious. It is anointed. Family, look around right now. Look around at one another. Some of you, you're, you're on the same pew with your family. Look at them for a moment. That life is precious. That life is precious. And David knew his life was precious. Our need to vilify people because of their wrongdoing, the choices that they make, is this is Hollywood. It's not Scripture. Scripture has compassion on every life. Every life is precious. Every life. Yes, even hers. And I know what she said behind your back. And you saw the screenshot of the text message. And her life is precious as well. Watch this. God rejected Saul as king of Israel. But God did not reject Saul as his son. Saul would lose the throne and so would his family. But that doesn't mean he one day won't sit on the throne with Jesus Christ. You don't know his story. Moses lost the responsibility of leading the children into the promised land, but he did not lose his friendship with God. God said, bro, I got to cut you, man. I love you, but I got to cut you. But only cutting you from this part, this aspect, you're going to have to step down as CEO. But you know what? You will always be my son. You will always be my daughter. These people that you vilify, that you have kind of ostracized yourself from and said, I will never come back here. I will never deal with them again. These people are precious in the sight of God. They're his precious babies. But pastor, you don't realize how they treat me and they've done this and they've done that. And God says, I get it. I get it. But I know them. This is what he told Nineveh. This is what he said to Jonah. Jonah, they don't know their left hand from their right hand. You hate on them. I love them. Because life is precious, family. Amen? Life is precious. There's someone here today who's been struggling. You have felt split right down the middle. Life for you, is, sometimes it's hot, sometimes it's cold, sometimes you're happy, sometimes you're sad. And it's, it's, it, it feels like it's, it's driving you to lose your mind completely. And God in this moment is saying, I'm watching, I care, and I want to just give you some, 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 some points of encouragement here. Stop comparing yourself. There is no one like you. You're already my precious baby. And you're already beloved. God is telling you right now, don't be afraid. You're not going to lose anything. You're gonna, you have, all you have right now is to gain. Trust me. I want you in the right place, in the right position. I want you in my will. And there's someone here today that simply wants to make that stand. You want to you you create more balance in your life. You want to get your equilibrium back. You want a little bit more stability. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. Oh, this is so vulnerable right now. I know this is, this is vulnerable, vulnerable. I'm not going to stand past. I don't want someone to think something's wrong with me. I know. You're perfect. You're one of those people that never has had an issue before. Oh, look at this. Isn't this beautiful? Amen. Is there anyone else? Anyone else? I just want the stability. I just want that stability back. I want that stability back. I want that equilibrium. Right now I feel split right down the middle, and you know what? That's really life. We'll be constantly navigating that and trying to find that balance. But that's life. That's life. Oh, there's more standing. Praise the Lord. Oh, isn't this beautiful? I stand with you. I stand with you. I stand with you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. People keep standing. Praise the Lord. Father, thank you. You're the God of David, you're the God of Saul. You're the God of crazy, instability. You're our God when we're depressed, when we're anxious, when we're fearful. 
when we compare ourselves to everything, even our former selves we compare ourselves to, we're just never satisfied. We never feel like we're enough, and yet you stand here today saying, you're enough for me. So we stand here before you as Saul. We stand here before you as David. Everywhere on the spectrum, Father, it's represented here. Those online, it's represented here. Thank you for getting it. Thank you for getting us. Jesus, thank you for coming here to understand what it's like to have that mental stress, to, to, to sweat blood through, from your pores and to, to go through battles of doubt. Thank you because you can relate. You're not going to tell me it's all in my head as my high priest. You're not going to tell me just to think more positively. No, you show me your nail-scarred hands. And you simply say to us, I get it. I get it. I get it. So, Father, we stand here as a church, vulnerable, frayed, open, honest, right now, before you, before one another. May we be able to embrace each other in our wounds. May we be able to create a community, an environment of stability in an unstable world. May Saul feel comfortable in these pews. And may David feel comfortable in these pews. Because this is what it means to have a heart of a champion. We acknowledge that many times we're just split right down the middle. Thank you for being in the middle with us, Christ. Be our healer. In Jesus' name, amen.